Welcome everyone to the Option Menu Crew podcast, and this is a new version of the podcast. I guess we're going to call it a different show, because this is Option Menu Crew Hot Fixes. Uh, we've decided, Ed and I, t- uh, to do a, or we're going to try and do a new weekly show, shorter format, where we just talk about the news of the week in video games, uh, kind of like you hear on, on a bunch of others, but we're going to stay really focused to just uh, the news stories of the week that we really care about. And we couldn't think of a better week to try and figure this out uh, than this week, where one of the biggest stories uh, has dropped in gaming, um, and it, it's pretty wild. Uh, it's it's really insane to think about this story, Ed. I can't believe it happened either. Uh, but with uh, with Italy's Senate getting exposed to Final Fantasy VII. Uh, smut. It's it's quite incredible, man. Can you can you believe it? What's your reaction when you heard the news? I, I, I just <laughs> expected it to happen at some point. I mean, I, you can't contain it. <laughs> I just put Ed in a bit he didn't know was going to happen. Uh, because we we talked about it, but I did not tell him I was going to do that. We we of course are going to talk about Microsoft announcing that they are buying Activision Blizzard King and what that means for gaming. But that was also a really funny news story, and I just wanted to catch Ed off guard <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with that one there. Yeah, so, actually, you, you did. <laughs> I really had but to I mean, I mean, like, I guess January is usually pretty light on news, which is, like, kind of the reason this is so exciting. Or, well, I don't know if exciting is the word. Um, it's but it's something. The, for the uninitiated, uh, the news story, like you said, is that Microsoft bought Activision Blizzard King for the eye-watering sum of, what is it, $68.7 billion? Yeah, all the news articles keep rounding it up to 70 So I'm going to pull up Microsoft, uh, the news.xbox.com's actual press release thing, uh, and take a look here. So we'll pull some information. Um so, what this acquisition includes is the following. Activision Publishing, Blizzard Entertainment, Beanox, Demonware, Digital Legends, High Moon Studios, Infinity Ward, King, Major League Gaming, Radical Entertainment, Raven Software, Sledgehammer Games, Toys for Bob, Treyarch, and then uh, they say every other team across Activision Blizzard. Uh, so they they have all that. Um, I've seen some places reporting that also this includes all of the titles of Sierra Gaming, which is a, has a few notable back catalog games here, but it doesn't look like they mention it in this post on news.xbox.com, uh, that one that seems to be from other stuff. So this news comes hot in comparison to the latest news regarding Activision Blizzard, which is the ongoing workplace harassment and litigations and lawsuits, uh, the call for Bobby Kotick to step down, uh, we'll, we'll extend that to also a bunch of the board members, whoever sided with him at that company, also ref- not electing to have him kicked off and also not electing to leave or to face consequences. Uh, I do want to say it right up front that all of them should face consequences. Uh, what's probably going to happen is the saddest thing, even though this deal apparently won't close until the end of the year and really Microsoft won't assume full control until 2023, what other news articles seem to be pointing out. Uh, but Bobby Kotick will probably be exiting, which hopefully means that Microsoft's management will be way better. Uh, who knows how much talent the companies might bleed until then, and who knows what kind of golden parachute Bobby Kotick might get from that. Uh, I, not to mention I, any I think we kind of do have an idea of the golden parachute. I, I saw a couple numbers floating around. I'm not sure which one is accurate. I saw anything from around 260 million to up to 400 million. So mm. um, he he stands to uh, to make a, a pretty penny, even if he doesn't remain at Activision, which it doesn't look like he will. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. Uh, this... This is crazy in and of itself, and if we didn't have all this terribleness hanging over it from the upper management that is now basically going to get away scot-free, and they're essentially getting paid off to leave uh, in a weird way, it's 
Yeah. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll, I just wanted to mention that at the top because I think that's the more important part of this is that, you know, workplace harassment shouldn't be tolerated and these people should be held accountable and examples need to be set very publicly as well. Um, and I don't think Microsoft's done a good enough job condemning that, especially since when the news started breaking with Activision Blizzard, it came out, they, like, one of Microsoft's statements was they're reevaluating their, um, relationship with Activision Blizzard and so this makes this that that statement makes this announcement very f humorous in a dark way uh, whether that was they were already in discussion which probably is true um, to hey you're in bad PR so maybe we can negotiate a cheaper deal uh, or who knows if Microsoft called them and so suddenly said hey uh, you're going to be in trouble, and you're probably not going to have like any money or lose a lot of shares here. So here's a plan. Who knows? I have no idea. I'm just speculating. Um, that, but, I but that is that is the glass half empty, and there is a case that if they are part of Microsoft, maybe it's a good thing for the employees. But but it certainly is a, a situation of one company exploiting the the misfortunes of another, and the misfortunes of the people under that company. Which, yeah, if the company was in different straits, like they were making good games and they just weren't selling well, and then Microsoft was like, hey, you know what, we're going to salvage this too. Kind of like a double fine situation where there are a bunch of creatives that just don't tend to make games that sell super huge, but all of their games are usually of pretty good quality and really creative. Microsoft bringing them on board, it, like, it, it always... It does suck to have exclusives because even though... Microsoft is doing a push for Xbox to be a platform of both its own consoles and for Windows PC, which is much more accessible to a bunch of people. It's it does the question we're going to get to is you know about how does this factor in for PlayStation, Nintendo, any other platforms that might be entering the space, uh, and the consoles, the competing consoles with Xbox. Uh, but yeah, I just don't give a lot of pity to Activision Blizzard. They put themselves in their own situation, and really they. Uh, I'm blaming this at management level, not really at the, the lower levels. People are just trying to do their jobs for the most part. Of course, there's individuals all over that are probably not behaving or being uh, terrible as well. But decision makers are the decision makers. They're the ones in charge. So I don't feel that bad. The only thing I wonder, but then we're getting to the part I think that you wanna, uh, you're you alluding to more is, you know, what does this mean for uh, gaming in general? with Microsoft owning now some of the biggest properties in gaming. Isn't, I mean, isn't call, even like call of duty Vanguard this year or last year was the top selling game, even though it was a poorly selling call of duty game. So, I mean, even with call of duty, we're talking the, the biggest to the biggest, um, you know, franchises in gaming. Yeah. Uh, call of duty, overwatch world of Warcraft, Candy Crush, just mentioning those. Uh, Diablo, I'll mention for funsies. It's it's wild. Essentially, Microsoft just acquired several new revenue streams. I say Candy Crush and World of Warcraft are just ways for them to bring in more money. Call of Duty Warzone, which is their free-to-play battle royale, and I think it has some other modes, but it's their free-to-play version of uh, Call of Duty, and that has microtransactions like. They're going to make their money back real quick on that, I think. That's why $70 billion is probably not that big a deal to them in general. Uh, I don't even know what the amount that those games are still bringing in on a weekly, let alone monthly basis or yearly. So I could see that, that once Microsoft's got full control of that, like they're, they're going to be fine in probably a quarter. <laughs> so um, that for them, uh, we, we were talking about it before, is that this could be like a smart move for them considering how much they want to push Game Pass. Game Pass continues to be such a, a great value to gamers, and Phil Spencer's comments have been that it's sustainable, which shows that it's an expense that it, or it could be a loss leader that's just not that big of a loss leader. So they're making good deals, they're building up that subscription base all the time, they're getting more people engaged, it's leading to additional sales on other things, so it might be they might not be making their profit back directly on, on Game Pass from its expenses, but they make the profit up in other places and are still well in the black thanks to the exposure that game and good press that Game Pass brings them. And now with having all these other games here, 
that's going to help. Uh, they're going to tap into some other revenue streams. Because I, I don't, it's going to be a few years probably before we see this, uh, whether or not somehow World of Warcraft might become part of Game Pass. Uh, the new Diablo most likely will be part of Game Pass at some point. Call of du- The new Call of Duties and how those will, will go over there. What's going to happen with Battle.net? Is that going to get rolled into Game Pass? Is it going to coexist on the side? Overwatch and Overwatch 2, like they they're, they get loot box money. What's going to go on with those? Um, which transitions us to that next article. The questions that everyone's asking is, what's Sony going to do? Because they were the leading platform, so there's a lot of Call of Duty players over there, plus just other franchises that are on the console. So we pulled aside an article from... Video Game Cent- uh Wait, is it Video Game Central? Sorry. Video Games Chronicle. Sorry. Thank you, Ed. Uh, VideoGamesChronicle.com. So, Ed, why don't you take us over what that article's saying and, you know, your thoughts. So, the statement from uh, Sony is that we expect multi-platform games due to contractual agreements. Um, and what they're saying here... Uh, I... You know, it's not quite clear. It's they they do have it. It says that the publisher has a long-standing content exclusivity agreement with PlayStation for the Call of Duty series, and that it is like maps and and certain DLC is uh, exclusive to PlayStation Four. And obviously, Microsoft is going to have to honor those contracts. From Phil Spencer, he'll say that I'll just say to players out there who are playing Activision Blizzard games on Sony's platform, it's not our intent to pull communities away from that platform, and we remain committed to that. But he also said that around the time of uh, you know the Zenimax acquisition with with Bethesda, and I I think people had a lot of hopes that something like Starfield was going to make it to PlayStation. And that's that's not going to be the case. Uh, you actually, there is actually a tweet from Spill Spencer, Phil Spencer, that says, <laughs> <laughs> "Was that on had, purpose?" <laughs> I wish. Um, had good calls this week with leaders at Sony. I confirmed our intent to honor all existing agreements upon acquisition of Activision Blizzard and our desire to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation. Sony is an important part of our industry, and we value our relationship. I don't know what what are your thoughts on that? I I it's it seems like it's very similar to what they said with Bethesda and and Zenimax and we we got Deathloop on PlayStation 5. Next up is Ghostwire Tokyo, but I guess all of this is going to depend on what those existing agreements are. Um and I'm sure all all of that was factored in to the price they paid for ABK and uh it's we really don't know, so I, it'll be interesting to find out over the years uh, how this acquisition affects the multi-platform status of Call of Duty and other games. Right. Um, my interpretation is that clearly there's stuff that hasn't been announced that they're just not talking about, and there's deals already in place for the current like Call of Duty games, Warzone. There may be events. Who knows if Sony already had deals in line for the next call for next year's Call of Duty, considering it's an annual cycle. Wouldn't be surprised if there might have been like bundle deals that PlayStation worked out with Activision and said, "Hey, so we, you know, we're still the dom- dominant console, so we're gonna put some money this way, so you keep bringing DLC and events our way." Um, and I, I strongly believe that what's gonna happen is. The free-to-play stuff that's like super accessible, like um, uh, like Warzone, Call of Duty Warzone. I think that's gonna stay on PlayStation because it's a free-to-play game. Why would Microsoft stop letting people go in there uh, and spend money and bring in revenue? So I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think World of Warcraft's gonna be pulled off anyone's servers or anything like that. If anything, Microsoft might try to do like what they did with Sega and Fantasy Star Online 2 and New Genesis and basically fund expansion of that game and be like, hey, make a world version of World of Warcraft for Xbox, um, maybe a controller-supported one. Final Fantasy XIV, uh, Realm Reborn, is controller-compatible and is on consoles. They could totally do that now. I could see that in a couple of years, or maybe a new version of World of Warcraft that's like 
that or and WoW Classic and stuff like that. They could find a way to bring those to Xbox, bring those to Game Pass, um, hopefully also to Steam or whatever versions or Battle.net. I don't even know. Maybe that's another big question there. People are used to Battle.net. Um, Overwatch, same thing. Uh, Overwatch 1, probably, it's not free to play yet. So I wouldn't, it'd be interesting to see if Overwatch actually gets turned into a full free to play game with the launch of Overwatch 2. And there's, there's also speculation about what's going on with Overwatch 2, and nobody's quite sure what's going on there, and if they're going to change their, their plans with that. And who knows what Microsoft's going to do, and maybe say like, hey, we're going to watch, we're going to launch Overwatch 2 as Overwatch 2.0, or whatever, and that's where they'll go, now it's going to be free to play, it's going to be on Game Pass, I mean, it's, it's going to be included on Game Pass, which means a whole bunch of new people are going to get to it without having to pay extra. Um... Or, yeah, c- kind of like the Sea of Thieves route. And maybe that's what they're going to do. Like, Sea of Thieves is not a free-to-play game. It's a Game Pass game, or you can buy it separately. And then you get the expansion content and stuff like that. And there's also microtransactions and stuff if you want if you want to do in it. But it's it's built like both. They, they, they just sell it like a normal game, and then they have a way for you to play it in sort of a subscription manner. So I feel like that's what's going to happen with Overwatch, probably at least number uh, number one. I've seen some people that I follow joking on Twitter about, like, maybe this means Xbox Game Pass is going to come to PlayStation, or, I mean, that's been a rumor for a while, and I bet that Microsoft has been trying to find a way to get Sony to agree to letting Game Pass be on there. Just like, I think it's an open secret that uh, uh, Xbox approached Nintendo and said, like, hey, isn't there a way to put Game Pass on on Switch? And Nintendo just was like, nah, we don't want to do it. Uh, and then we still see games like Ori and the Blind Forest and uh, Ori Will of the Wisps make their way to Switch ports and stuff like that. Nintendo also gets cloud versions of games, so I wouldn't be surprised if... Um, oh, Banjo-Kazooie, the N64 version, just recently launched on Nintendo's expanded online service, which is trash. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the version... I wasn't saying the port is trash. I'm saying their, their service is trash. Um, Nintendo service. I, I, think, I think it's really unlikely that... that- we see ever see game pass on Sony's platform, especially with the rumors of them launching their own subscription service. I don't, I don't think they'd be, they'd settle for just having a cut of game pass, which is really, I guess all they would get if that's uh, what they allowed on their platform. I, I've heard other people say this, so I'm, I'm parroting them, but that the idea that Xbox could convince Sony to be like, look, we'll bring Xbox exclusive games to PlayStation, but you have to let us do like an Xbox Game Pass type app and do that. And I'm sure Sony's like, no, we don't need your stuff or that's, you know, it's a, it's a precedent setter. But that'd be cool. That would be a great way. Like imagine if Halo and Sea of Thieves and now all these other games would be the only way. And I'm sure that's kind of like their Trojan horse of being like, eh, well then we're not going to sell COD anymore for PlayStation except through the Game Pass. And Sony clearly doesn't want to allow that to happen. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Microsoft strong arms them into that. My, uh, Sony has been incredibly resistant to other uh, efforts that are far more positive, such as allowing crossplay for their games. And you know, for them, it's just like they don't they don't feel the reason they don't see a profitable reason why to do it, other than uh, I'm guessing like Epic was the and I hate I hate to give them points, but credit where credits due. Epic with Fortnite was able to strong arm Sony into going, hey, if you don't do this, like maybe we go out, maybe we do other stuff or we like limit our partnership more. And I'm sure Sony was just like, fine, whatever. And they relented and now they let more games do um uh do cross play with other with other platforms. And sometimes they care, sometimes they don't. They have their weird rules that came out during the lawsuit stuff. So we understand that like Sony will is still trying to just make money off it. Um yeah, my interpretation is a lot of the current games that are planned for like the next two years will probably still make it to PlayStation, uh, unless Microsoft buys out some of those contracts. But I think there's certain games that are just going to stay available, just like how Minecraft stayed available on everything. And Minecraft, it would have been stupid to pull Minecraft from all those other platforms because tons of people play it. And I think that's the same thinking that's going to go into these other ones. Microsoft knows that their revenue streams from taking from uh from being on these other platforms. And Microsoft has been actively trying to partner and you know they just can't reach a deal where everyone's happy. 
And that makes sense. It's big business, and they're all super greedy. So nobody's trying to play fair, and no one's really thinking about the gamers. Xbox is trying to think of the gamers because they're trying to win as much goodwill as they can. And that's where this acquisition is kind of, like, weird. Because it's they're, they're, they're not really buying goodwill. They're forcing players' hands. And we'll see how that pans out in the future years when it comes to the newer games that come out uh, in the next, like, two years. But, yeah, what do you think about that, Ed? Do you feel like... Um, what do you feel about those games now coming to uh, Xbox in the future of possibly PlayStation owners now missing out on it? I think you're ultimately going to see almost everything be exclusive to Xbox. I think you're right about Warzone having continued support on PlayStation, but I think later entries in the Call of Duty series, once they're free of those contractual obligations, are going to be one of the reasons, if not the main reason, for a lot of people to subscribe to Game Pass and to get into the Xbox ecosystem. And I, I think it's it's a it's a very good time for Xbox and Microsoft to get out the word that you know Call of Duty is going to be a Microsoft franchise because this is the point where a lot of people are deciding which uh, console they want to purchase in this new generation. Uh, it's also a point where Sony is struggling to keep up demand with with demand for the PlayStation 5 and where Xbox Series S is frequently available even on store shelves. So it's kind of this perfect storm where I think um I think Sony has has got to be sweating a little bit that uh this is this is going to be tough for them because they make a lot of money off of Call of Duty and all those microtransactions and the you know all the all the cut that they get of every single sale. Sony doesn't really have a a competitive first person shooter that's my Microsoft has always had Halo but um and Call of Duty has I guess been more popular but without Call of Duty that's kind of a hole in the lineup on on PlayStation. I you know I'm conflicted. I think it's it's a bad thing that um at least potentially bad that Xbox is just taking these exclusives for themselves and when they were formerly multi-platform. But I think that it may give Sony real motivation to maybe, you know, maybe they invest in, in trying to come up with their, their own, um, you know, first person shooter games that, that, uh, they don't have, uh, maybe they invest more in a better subscription service to keep people in the PlayStation ecosystem. Uh, I think I think they kind of had an easy time of the last generation. You know, you remember at the beginning with the Xbox One and the PlayStation Four, how easy it was for Sony to to riff on Xbox for wanting to get rid of used games. Uh, but so they, I think they're they kind of went into this PlayStation Five and Xbox Series X generation thinking, you know, we've got this in the bag, but they don't now. Yeah. Um... It's, it, it, yeah, there's a lot of arrogance that goes into it, and Sony had this problem also with the PlayStation 3 era going into that. Um, Sony has tried to have its own killer first-person shooter uh, app. It tried twice with both uh, Killzone and Resistance. Both of those games got multiple iterations, and uh, Killzone got a, next, uh, or a PS4 generation uh, installment in the beginning but just for whatever reason those never took hold um i know for some it was like weird controls and stuff but i i guess they just never quite had their own hook at the same time the audiences are just different between xbox and playstation playstation has always been catch playing catch up with its online services to compare to xbox xbox has always just had a head start so i think part of that is like the the user experience of being online and doing the shooters so i don't know um there are some Definitely some other like shooters out there that are in independent that could be picking up steam on uh, on PC, and Sony could always acquire one of those smaller ones and cultivate them. They could cultivate a new studio and be like, hey, we need a massive multiplayer hit uh, that's exclusive to us, and so they might be they might recruit a studio for that, or they might build a, a new studio or team internally to to fill that. 
I don't know if they'll bring back Resistance or Kill Zone. I feel like even I got, I'm not immersed enough in those fan bases to know, but I don't feel like those carry enough goodwill for Sony to necessarily need to uh, to revive one of those as their killer app. I feel like it should be something new. They've really been kind of killing it with their new single uh, single player IPs like Horizon, Last of Us, Uncharted, uh, The Ghost of Tsushima. So I feel like that's the way they should go, is they should invest into a new team, create a new IP, have a strong single player component, and work on creating a really strong multiplayer component. Last of Us, there's uh, the multiplayer mode for number one uh, was really well received for a long time. It tapered off, of course, but it was it didn't really get a lot of support. It wasn't a huge deal to to Sony as it was just kind of it seemed like it was just kind of a pet project, uh, and it ended up being well received. Then uh, the rumors came around, and then announcement. I believe it was an announcement after Last of Us Part Two that like yes, we're going to do Last of Us Part Two. But we're also going to work on a multiplayer mode or something or a side multiplayer game that will be a Last of Us themed one. And people have been wondering if that'll pick up. Uh, there's also the rumored remake of, uh, I don't know if it's actually officially announced yet, but remake of supposedly a PS5 remake of The Last of Us Part 1. And if that includes the multiplayer there, that would make a lot of sense. And that could be their, their um, big uh, revival there. Who knows if they did something with Uncharted? I, I think that they should do a standalone IP that is multiplayer focused rather than trying to breathe life into one of these extra modes that just tacked on to another valued IP that's got more of a single player audience than it does a, a multiplayer audience. Um, not that they couldn't break the mold and something could really take off and they could really invest into it and it could work. It just doesn't seem like that's the way things trend. Call of Duty started it. You've had Battlefield. Battlefield's been playing second fiddle to uh, Call of Duty for years. Star Wars Battlefront, that's a licensed IP there, and that is probably more popular than uh, than Battlefield at this point. Then there was Titanfall, and that got taken down, even though that a lot of people were saying, like, this should be the new Battlefield, and that didn't happen. EA messed that up royally. And now they have Apex Legends. Uh so that's the thing where it that's and that's the thing. Apex Legends is said to be tied to Titanfall, but that just seems like kind of a mouth ser uh, lip service to the franchise that uh, has got a little bit more um, uh, familiarity for the for the users uh, for the players. So yeah, uh, I don't know how Sony's going to handle this. I will probably see them acquire one or two more studios. I know we were. Uh, joking around a little bit about what if they bought Square Enix because of the way that uh, Square Enix and Sony have been partnering for years and that recent um, art news going around that Square Enix was going to make Final Fantasy games skip Xbox hardware because I think Final Fantasy 16 and Stranger, Stranger of Paradise aren't coming to Xbox. At least they haven't been announced for it. I thought Stranger of Paradise, of, uh, of Stranger of Paradise was. Uh, let me double check. But we do have more news, so I'll double check on that. And uh, unless there was there something else you wanted to say uh, about this, or I, I'll just say that I, I'm very conflicted about the whole thing, um, and I, I can see positives to the news, but also negatives. Um, I guess what I'll say is that I I want to, Sony to have more competition you know, and pressure on them to improve the. Their, the quality of their games and services and offerings, but I'm not sure if this is the way I wanted the pressure to be applied. Right, right. And I think this also just goes to show that Microsoft is really investing long-term, and I think that their teams got pushed back. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the new IP and games that will be coming out of their uh, previously acquired studios, the more individual ones and not like the big acquisitions that, like before Bethesda, I think a lot of those games are just taking a lot more time than they were hoping for. And so this is kind of like a quick thing of like, well, we have the opportunity, let's jump on it. And this will also give us some quick wins while we wait for the other stuff to incubate and long term. They're gonna, they're trying to pull a Sony. They're trying to do what Sony did, I th or at least that's the way I think of it, is they're trying to build these really strong internal studios that can make really good games, but they're going to have the Microsoft level budget and, or at least, you know, resources 
and be able to put out that stuff and make Xbox the home of these killer new beloved IP. Um, and that that's the hope. That's the dream, it seems like. Um, and yes, you were right. Uh, Stranger of Paradise is scheduled for Xbox release. So that one's not there, but we'll see what happens uh, going forward past uh, what, Final Fantasy VII Remake. I guess Remake Part 1 and then that saga of games may never come to Xbox. Uh, but who knows? We'll see how that we'll see how that ends up um, once we get past the next year because Integrade release on PlayStation Five apparently like bought them another year of exclusivity. It just came to PC. We know it's going to or uh, via Epic Game Store, so it's probably going to come to Steam next year, and we'll see when the Steam release, the inevitable Steam release, happens. Whether or not Xbox is part of that as well, or maybe a Nintendo Switch Cloud version. I I hope not. Poor poor Switch players. They can't. They can't get us a, a good win. Yeah, it would be tough to only have a Switch as your console. Um, yeah, so we had two more things on the docket, but we're kind of running over our own set time limit here. So um, I guess, Ed, if, if we can agree, we'll just try and be brief on these thoughts, but I don't think there's much we have much to say about it. Uh, yeah, the, these were two of the things that I think um, I found interesting. Yeah, and, uh, they are interesting. Yeah, let me just start with the first one, and this is that Google is bringing Android games to Windows in in a limited beta. Uh, This comes from XDA developers, and uh, this limited beta is only available to some users in Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan, Mm. which I think that makes sense. You know, mobile games are are very popular in those markets. And Um, they have PCs that are capable of playing mobile phone mobile gaming but this is what you know one of the features that that microsoft had announced as being uh part of windows 11 and that was the ability to natively run android apps so i guess this was only a matter of time but it's it's interesting to think of what the possibilities would be yeah it makes sense it's just letting your games be available on more platforms and for mobile it really makes more sense a lot of these games um, are starting to get controller support, and there's an audience of people that are just never going to want to play on their phone. They don't want to use touchscreens. They don't want to carry a controller around in their pocket. They don't want to buy any of those controller attachments. And it's it's just a lot of there's the emulation uh, platforms that people have been using already to play mobile games on computer. Why not just monetize that and reach that section of the market there? It, it's it's a porting thing. Maybe it's a bit of a cost, but Google's got the money to do it. And I feel like this is inevitable. However, maybe it stays like as one of those things that's exclusive to the Asian territory for a, forever or a long time because of just the, the nature of that market. Maybe it never comes west. But it seems silly for it not to come west, uh, especially the way that PC gaming is growing over here and uh, how big our market is. So getting a few more gamers that maybe weren't playing on their phone or maybe will convert to like, oh, yeah, this is kind of fun here. I play mostly on my uh, computer, and that's where I got started. But, oh, I can play it on my phone. So you know what? I'm on the bus. I'm here. I might play a little bit on my phone. And it might work both ways in terms of converting those users into full play, uh, the, those gamers into actual uh, uh, recurring players. So, yeah, it seems neat. Um, hopefully it comes westward and we'll, we'll see more news about this. I, I think it's inevitable mostly, but it could be one of those weird, like, they're just going to launch it in the, the Asian territory for a long time. Uh, or or maybe it doesn't even catch on. It just fizzles out. This is this is very early on in this this uh, development. I don't know. If this is a limited beta, I think that me that's far enough. Like, they're just doing bug testing. That's what I think. I think it's that me it they wouldn't be doing this limited beta or we wouldn't be hearing about this if they didn't have plans to get this out and, like, a year or so. Well, what I mean is, is Google is is uh, infamous for starting new projects and canceling them a short time later. Um, so that is true. This is, hopefully, this is not one of them. That is true. But and and uh, my thinking is that with Android, that's much more of a sustainable mobile platform thing that's been around forever. So that's where I have a little more optimism of like. They're probably going to push this through because it's it's the easiest thing. It's like, what? Oh, you just make our games playable on another platform and we just make more money that way? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. So uh, the optimism is not so much hopeful, in my opinion, as more as like speculative optimism. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's happening. But that is. 
And then our last story, which is something that's kind of been floating around for a while. It just seems like it's closer now to actually happening. Go ahead, Ed. This story coming from a website called Gaming on Phone is that the Chinese government introduces new regulations for gamers for Lunar New Year, Year 2022. The idea here is that from January 17th to February 15th, video gamers are only allowed to play, sorry, young, young, young gamers are only allowed to play one hour each day. I guess this is just the Chinese government doesn't want, um, you know, young people spending too much time playing video games on their time off, um, you know, on their vacation. It's do other stuff. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that approach to regulation, but it is worth noting that a lot of the games that are popular in China kind of, uh, you know, toe the line into uh, gambling, you know, the, where uh, mobile games and gacha games are, are much more popular and accepted than they are in the West. It's just weird, you know. We come from a we we come from a culture where that those kind of uh, rules for for children are generally expected to be enforced by parents, and that is obviously not the case in China. Well, Chinese government is in, in basically just trying to control their people, so and already has control of the industry. Uh, what's interesting is that the gaming sector has become growing in popularity so for them to be limiting this um once again speculating completely just based on things it seems like it's just a play on like there's probably like insurgents groups and stuff that are using gaming to coordinate younger people being exposed to outside propaganda you know i'm getting outside of the the carefully curated chinese you know news networks and propaganda and stuff like that um that's my my, my guess is why this is really happening not so much for actual health productive reasons so uh it, i think it's hilarious because it just seems like they're cutting off money but i guess they make money in all sorts of different ways and whatnot and the chinese government has proved they really don't care about a lot of things so yeah it, it's i think it's just kind of hilarious to see because i feel like what's going to happen now is we're going to see a lot of really comical headlines over in the next couple months uh once this is like in full swing is like how Pe the people in China are circumventing uh, uh, all these restrictions and whatnot, and this kid that like kid manages to play for ten hours a day using a legal VPN or something in China, you know that kind of stuff. Um, it's really funny, and it's so it's so interesting to see or humorous that this would be happening when like you know in our country like that would just never fly. It's so weird how that would uh, happen, how that how this is even happening somewhere else in the world but that that's you know that's what you get in a, a dictatorship so um yeah i i i'm curious what the the headlines are going to look like from that it's just it's very strange that it's happening and uh but yeah to the more core argument of like if we if we're thinking about this in just in terms of like the the pure oh trying to help kids stay healthy um, yeah, a lot of parents parents should take responsibility for that stuff. But what do we do? What 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 should we have as a policy level, if anything, in terms of like making sure that people who don't behave like can be held accountable for for stuff like this? And I think there's plenty of checks and balances in society for people who game too much. But you know, looking at the other side, we talk about like gambling addiction, and you were saying like microtransactions, loot boxes, etc. Where's all that stuff in terms of, like, for gaming side and what sort of regulations? And some of that's already happened, and it scared a lot of investors. And we see, like, EA with Battlefront 2 made a huge, you know, mistake in uh, trying to get away with that stuff. Um, got a bunch of people involved. Got a bunch of legislation and, and lawyers paying attention in governments. So we'll see. Um, who knows what uh, what's what's going to really become of this. But, it, yeah, it's a whole separate argument on the the on the the objective part of like what do you do with trying to help people have a balanced life and not like over video game or overindulge in anything really yeah 
a lot of people have trouble with overindulgence and and and, and everything. And yeah, I think uh, every every one Addictions. of us has has our own vice. Right, right, and yeah. So that's uh, that's the news we were talking about this week. We this is very much a work in progress because we're trying to do this little schedule here. We're not discontinuing the full episodes we do, though we might change the scheduling up because of the way this is. Once again, we're doing this for fun. We're not really doing this for profit or anything. We don't have any sort of way for that. We do appreciate the support. So anyone who does listen or subscribe, you know, we we appreciate you and. and uh, we we look forward to seeing like feedback, comments, and things like that. If you like the shorter format, um, we've been talking about the news, and we we're just thinking of different ways to experiment. So once again, we also don't promise that this will continue forever, but it's something we're playing around with, and we're just trying to have fun with it. So yeah, this has been the the first episode of uh, Option Menu Crew Hot Fixes, and uh, yeah, this is for the week of. Sorry, I'm looking at the calendar. This is you can tell how loose this is, but for uh, I guess by the time you hear this, it'll be like either the 22nd or the 23rd of January, and this will be looking back in that week. Um, but yeah, th- those episodes, these episodes aren't going to be numbered the way our traditional ones are. This is going to be kind of week of, so we might not even worry about the date there, but we'll just say on there, and we, uh, we're recording this on a Thursday, so we're, we're working all that stuff out and figuring it out, and, and uh, so... We apologize if this there's sloppy scheduling we don't, and and whatnot, but uh, yeah, bear with us and uh, we hope you enjoyed and uh, yeah, keep an eye out for the news next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>